uh, stress hormones, life cycles, and global change. Now we've heard on several occasions here at this meeting about interactions between the environment and behavior, and the environment and genes. And in between those, there's a uh, black box, which is what intrigues me, or what are the mechanisms by which environmental cues and change in the environment affect uh, morphology, physiology, and particularly behavior. And in the light of global change, it's somewhat surprising that we still don't know a whole lot about how animals perceive their environment and transduce that information into uh, behavioral responses. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's one example, and I'd like to start out by acknowledging my uh, uh, co-authors here, Fran Bonnier, Liz Elizabeth Addis, Sarah O'Brien, Jason Davis, Gun Wan, and Aaron Clark. Now, for many decades now, I've been working on white crowned sparrow. This is one of our uh, long-term study animals, and the reasons are that it has a tremendous latitudinal range with uh, Arctic birds that are long-distance migrants, and then non-migrants, such as the California coastal mammals white crown, and also altitudinal uh, ranges as well. And curiously, this one subspecies, Putitensis, has undergone a recent range expansion, whereas the others have not, just to the south and to the north and in the mountains. They are still pretty much where they always were. So if we go, I went back and looked at the literature and was able to find some papers going back to 1857, some of the original expeditions to this area. And they refer to the white crown sparrow, with pretty loud song and hard to miss, as being pretty much entirely coastal and contiguous with the knuckles white crown sparrow in California, that they're very restricted to the coast, with the exception of one or two birds here in southern Puget Sound and those going up the Columbia and the Willamette here. In, uh, in Oregon, but otherwise pretty much close to water, coastal. And um, then over the past 50 years or so, the birds started moving. And now we find them throughout the Puget Sound Basin and also the interior of Oregon, and they're up over the crest of the Cascades, uh, right to the edge of the sagebrush, which perhaps is, is limiting for them. So this has all happened over the past 50 years, most intensely over the past 10. So what we see now is here's uh, original habitat, ancestral habitat, which they're still in, very abundant in on the coast, Pacific coast. And they've moved up into the mountains and also into urban areas, and they particularly like these large parking lots. Doesn't matter whether it's the University of Washington or Kmart, they really love these things. And they agreed quite happily. And you can see these two environments are somewhat different, and one of my immediate thoughts was how do they do this? Not only why have they done it, but what are potential mechanisms. And what we've found is looking uh, over the past 30 years or so, that the original breeding habitat was mostly coastal. They've extended the breeding range into urban, inland, and alpine <coughs> habitats, all disturbed by humans. They're only found in habitat disturbed by humans. So even in the mountains, they're in ski areas. They love the ski areas and the slopes. And in western Washington state, breeding does not appear to be occurring earlier unlike it's been shown in many other species with global warming, but it may be ending later, and we hope to nail that down in the next couple of years. And the location of the transition zone from migratory putitensis to sedentary states appears to have moved to near the northern edge of the range, over 700 kilometers north. So there are a number of things, we, questions one could ask, and there are a number of, of uh, avenues we're pursuing, but I'd like to focus in on one of these now, and that is, how the animals respond to stress. And uh, because the urban habitats and the uh, alpine habitats, at least early in spring, have the potential for a coastal bird to be very stressful. So the way we look at this is we catch birds in mist nets and we collect blood samples from the wing vein. And in the plasma of those samples, we can measure the levels of one of the so-called stress hormones, corticosterone, from the adrenal cortex. And if we take a sample right at capture within one to three minutes, we know this is representative of the plasma cord level just before capture. And then we take other samples at 5, 10, 30, and 60 minutes while we land, <coughs> weigh them, and then we hold them in cloth bags. If we look at the, uh, for the, the duration, if we look at the baseline levels over time of day, this increase that we see is not an artifact of time of day. It really is a response to this uh, um, manipulation. And this is what we call the adrenocortical response to acute perturbations or stress or stress series. 
This is highly conserved across the vertebrates from fish to humans. So if you were to grab me and collect a series of blood samples and put me in a bag and hand me on a hook, I'd show exactly the same profile, <laughs> but it would be cortisol, not corticosteroid. Okay, so what does it do? Well, the, um, first of all, corticosteroids, over a period of minutes to hours, suppress um, necessary physiological and behavioral functions such as breathing, migration. They activate facultative behavioral patterns that promote survival, emergency behaviors, we, we call it. They prepare the immune system for possible infection, wounding, and sickness behavior. And also mobilize uh, energy, gluconeogenesis, they also mobilize free fatty acids and so forth. And in some, the combination of these, and I don't have time to go into the experimental <coughs> evidence for this, which is accrued over uh, 20 years or so, but the um, purpose of all of this uh, together is that they then avoid the long-term effects of stress-induced high levels of glucocorticoids. So they are avoiding chronic stress by triggering this, this uh, um, uh, emergency type behavior. So in essence, although we tend to call these hormones stress hormones, a more accurate description of them would be anti-stress hormones. Okay, so we also know that this stress response is modulated over the year, something we did not expect. If we look at the long distance migrant white, white crown sparrow, the baseline in, uh, open bars, the blue bars are maximum levels. We see this tremendous upregulation on arrival in the Arctic when weather is extremely bad, and then once they commit to breeding, it comes down to a low during molt. And we think that this increase in the responsiveness to stress in the early breeding season allows the animals to cope with extremely uh, stressful conditions in the Arctic, and then once they commit to breeding, they decrease. In contrast, Putitensis and also Nuttles, White Crown Sparrow to the south, do not show this kind of modulation. So one of the questions then we can ask um, is, well, first of all, we had uh, three major study areas here out on the coast to find out whether these lowland putitenses have actually changed their responsiveness to acute stress. Some in Seattle that I won't talk about much today, and up in the mountains, Stephen Pass being one, although we had about four or five locations in each area. This is very close. The mountain ones are very close, in fact, right next to some of the territories of Gamble's White Crown Sparrow, the mountain one, which has been there ancestrally, as far as we can tell. And um, the Gamble's White Crown Sparrow are always in natural alpine meadows, and the Pugitensis are always in human disturbed areas. <coughs> so, questions. Mountain Gamble Eye, as does the Arctic one, upregulate the adrenocortical response to stress in spring. This method possibly is a way of coping with extremely unpredictable uh, conditions in the mountains. The lowland putitensis at the same latitude do not modulate the adrenocortical response to stress during breeding at all. So they don't upregulate in the early spring or downregulate during breeding. So a hypothesis then is that mountain putitensis should now show higher adrenocortical responses to stress than the lowland populations. And what we found is here we have lowland putitensis over minutes here, and this is the corticosterone level, and nuttles white crown sparrows in California that are, show a relatively low response throughout the breeding season. Actually, this is early spring. And here is mountain white crown sparrow, mountain gambles white crown sparrow that show this much higher level. The lowland putitensis are way up here. We did not anticipate this at all. These are some of the highest stress responses we've ever seen in any bird and actually rival some of the uh, um, other vertebrates as well that, that uh, tend to be very high. So not only do they just match what they see in mountain white hands, they get even higher. <coughs> so at this point, I started asking the question, well, what, what happened here? This is really way above what we would have expected for these uh, birds that are at the front line of an expanding population. So, hypothesis then, and second hypothesis was that populations of putitensis in, in ancestral habitat in the lowlands are heterogeneous in traits associated with breeding season and migration. What I mean here is that the prediction would be that lowland putitensis had greater individual variation in stress series profiles than either nuttallite or gambolite to the south, nuttallite to the south or gambolite in, in the mountains. 